It is 12.30pm on the 19th of November. This is a Thursday. I don't need these anymore. The audio appears to be working for a freaking change on this fine live stream channel. And <laughs> that's a relief. I'm sure you will tell me if the audio falls over in due course in the chat and I'll look out for that. But anyway, we're here to talk today about a question from one of you named Ben Stumpo. Stumpy. Stumps. And uh, he's a bit torn between I-30N and a stinger. And yes, these are not wholly logical competitors, but hey, life's not wholly logical, is it? And you're allowed to like both, and you're allowed to have them on your short list, even though, have you noticed, there's never a road test like that in a car blog or website, whatever YouTube channel, nobody ever goes, I-30N, the stinger, which one should you buy, even though some people end up with the kookiest cars on their short lists. So we'll get into that in just a second. And after that, if you like, I'll just take some questions from you. Don't forget tonight at 8.30, a whole hour of Q&A with you live streaming. That's 8.30 p.m. Sydney time. If you've got the time and you'd like to, you know, take a break from your family or better still, give them that gift, which is the break from you. You can do that at 8.30 p.m. Uh, tonight and ask me a few questions and you know just be here for the chat generally because one of the things I love about this live stream process is it's a real chance to interact with you in the way that you can't with a pre-recorded package obviously and I have done actual research today what a dangerous precedent four frigging pages of it like Jesus don't be expecting this every live stream I had to get up at the crack of 11 to get this out in time before we get into Stinger versus i30N, I thought we might deal with a couple of pressing comments from you on the feed, on the comments feed on YouTube, okay? First, the Lorax. Now, I do have some time for someone who identifies with the Lorax, which as far as I can see was the world's first environmental activist novel for children, Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Yes. teaching all those kids to be interested in books, obviously the precursor to literacy, which some people in our society do enjoy. It's 50-50 split in the comments feed, though. Have you ever noticed how illiterate people are unafraid to go near a keyboard? I don't understand that. Anyway, the Lorax asks this quite pertinent question. Are you this much of an annoying wanker in all these videos? Yeah, pretty much I am. This is in relation to a recent Don't Buy This Ford video. That might have been the Enduro one or the, the Mustang one or Don't Buy Ford generally. I mean, it's all a blur in the past, okay? But I didn't think I hit the annoying wanker benchmark in any of those. I thought I was a bit below par there. So usually the Lorax, I'm a bit more of an annoying wanker. He goes on to clarify, and no, I've never owned a Ford. The articulation of Straya is enough to put me off ever watching another. Like I care. Don't watch. There's no gun at your head with any of these mediums, right? TV, radio, online, this or that. Nobody puts a gun at your head and says watch. When you switched speaking normally, it showed why people might watch any of them, but I can't deal with the other John. Fair enough, the Lorax. It's, uh, it, there are two Johns. There's good John and evil John, and obviously evil John comes out and rocks and rolls from time to time on the channel, and I've got no control over that. We are a mixture, after all, aren't we? A bit of a mashup of different personalities, but, you know, I'd strongly suggest... This is something I learned from a, a mentor of mine. If you're an old fart like me, you probably remember Clive Robertson. He was... Uh, a sort of comedic genius, you know, and I was fortunate enough to work with him on Radio 2 UE extensively and he became a mentor of sorts to me. And it became obvious after numerous conversations with Clive that, you know, the audience is kind of split in between people who love you and people who hate you and the, the enemy is therefore indifference. And some of the most loyal listeners, viewers, readers, whatever – are the ones who hate you, you know, because people just aren't happy. At least some people just aren't happy unless they're outraged, unless they've got some outrage to express. He's such a bastard. When's he up next? <laughs> sort of thing. So 
There's that. The Lorax, I don't give a shit if you watch. Watch or don't, I don't care. Uh, But, you know, if you are moved to comment, you're probably moved to watch again. So I think this whole business about not being able to deal with evil John, Australia, John, America, all of that stuff. Well, I think that's bullshit, mate. Tony Weavers also says, all your tools look brand new and unused. Yes, they look both of those things. Well spotted. Are they just props? You may as well point with a shovel rather than a spanner. I can understand pointing with a ruler, but a spanner. Well, let us deal with these issues, okay? Now, one of the things is, I might go to camera two for this. One of these things is tools of this nature are, in a sense, props, but they're a prop that says something about you. And I've made reference to the mighty King Dick so many times. You know, back when I used to do these... um, mail sack kind of interacting with you pre-recorded videos we used to award the mighty king to the biggest dick on the program and my obsession with the mighty king extended to uh, amassing a collection of that kind of thing here's an antique mighty king the mighty leyland king dick you don't see that very often and i'm very fortunate to own one picked it up on ebay i think if memory serves so that's a thing of beauty and a joy to behold as well and It came to light the other day that I could procure for myself a set of these beautiful Mighty King ratcheting podgers. Oh, that's just... Listen listen to that. Hang on. Prepare yourself. It's not quite orgasmic, but, you know, it's close. And as a pointer for the... Uh, Big Art and Physics episodes, I think it's it's very, you can jam the point home or you can hammer the point home with one of these babies. And if it's important, you know, you can reach for the star, can't you? The 27 and 32 millimeter ratcheting podger. Just listen to this one. How good is that? Anyway, so that's... The issue of pointing, I think, you know, if you're an engineer talking about physics, it makes sense to use a device such as this instead of a frigging ruler. I mean, come on. Are we men or what? Now, on the issue of the age of the tools and are they just props, just bear with me one second. Now, these have been there for donkey's years ever since I reinvented the studio here. And I'd suggest to you, do these look like brand new and unused whatever? The nut fucker and the mighty ball pain hammer. I mean, this ball pain hammer might as well have come out with the first friggin' fleet. It's just had, you know, ten new handles and three new heads in that time sort of thing. So, not just props, dude. Come on. Now, where were we? Let us deal with Stumpy. Stumps. Ben Stumpo. He says, my next car is going to be one of these two options, which would be Stinger or i30N. He goes on, but I'm a bit stuck as to which to proceed with. I have aspects I love and loathe, but promised myself I will wear my big boy pants and suck it up during ownership about both cars. This is so important, right? So important because there's no perfect car. It's just like being married, okay? And I've been married, I don't know, six or seven times, something like that. And You really have to just embrace the positives, don't you? And you have to learn to tolerate the negatives. And this is the case with every relationship. Relationship with the car, relationship with the boss, relationship with the boss's secretary, okay? She's hot and she's up for it anytime, anywhere. She's the girl who can't say no, perhaps. But, you know, you might just ruin your life as a result. So you've got to tolerate the negatives and embrace the positives. (laughs) Same with the car. So, stump oh. I am absolutely on board with you there. So that's good. The question I've got is what logical process arrives somebody at the point where they've got a short list of two cars and one's a Stinger and one's an i30N because they're just not logical competitors, are they? And I guess that's because life's not logic and logical and you're allowed to love two different cars, two very different cars. You're allowed to be enamoured differently, you know, and the two cars don't have to conform to the same V-Fact segment or something like that. So with that in mind, let's deal with these specific questions from Stampo. And uh, he says, that said, my questions to you are, do you think there will be good negotiation opportunities on a manual I-30N once the DCT is unleashed in Oz? Okay, so... 
i30N is about to come out in dual clutch transmission form. It's been six speed manual to date. And I think a lot of people are hanging out for the DCT, frankly. And typically this is because they're in a relationship in which the other party to this relationship is not that enamored of performance cars and doesn't really want to drive a manual. So the DCT is going to come in handy there. And so there's that, okay? A lot of people are going to queue up to buy the DCT, and it's really going to depend on what the stock levels are like. So if Hyundai runs down the stock levels of i30N manuals and pumps up the DCT, then negotiation opportunities on the manual might not be that profound, okay? But if there's a few manuals sitting around in dealerships and the DCT has a queue of wannabe buyers over the horizon, you know, take a number and we'll get to you sort of thing, then yeah, if you want a manual and it is in stock and everyone else wants a DCT, right at that moment when demand for the manual has sort of plummeted, then I think you could be in a good position to negotiate a suitable price on the manual. Ben goes on and says, do you think there will be at least reasonable market of drivers wanting manual i30N once the DCTs are an option? Yeah, I think demand for the manual i30N is going to kind of continue unabated. You have to be a particular kind of animal to want that car. And, you know, if you're a pure driving enthusiast, uh, which I frankly classify myself as so i'd buy the i30n manual regardless of the availability of the dct even though i suspect the dct all things considered would be faster around a racetrack you know if you get two drivers or one <laughs> one driver who is able to fully exploit the performance potential of the platform at every point on the track which is let's face it what your job is if you're sitting behind the wheel on a racetrack then I think the DCT is is definitely going to be quicker for uh, per lap from A to B, whatever. All right, and that's simply because you're not going to lose any time changing because the changes are just lightning fast. It's what DCTs do best, right? So there's there's all of that to consider. But yeah, there's going to be a reasonable market of drivers. And Ben goes on and says, or if resale value was a consideration, DCT would be the only option. Uh, no, I don't see that. I think there's going to be resale demand for roughly equally. Once the market gets saturated for DCTs, there'll be whatever proportion of DCTs out there. And it might ultimately be a bigger seller than the manual. I don't know. But in any case, the manual is going to have a market in the used domain, and I don't think there'll be any difference in the depreciation as a percentage, right? Provided the DCT lives up to all expectations. Ben goes on and says, do you think the DCT will rock compared to the manual, or will the manual be the only way to get the most out of the performance aspects of the i30N? Well, in addition to what I just said about the DCT probably being quicker around a racetrack, there's there is something about there is something about the tactile aspect of driving one of these cars you know so if it's got a rock then you have to love using it and i've got to say that manual is superb particularly the rev matching right if you want to turn the rev matching off you can do that and heel and toe the old way but you know the rev matching is so good it's silk in that car and it's just it's incredible fun to do that around a racetrack or a favorite piece of twisty road and you know with the bimodal exhaust and the crackle it's just awesome so dct quicker manual for me at least more fun okay uh, ben goes on and says if you had the funds to choose either car would you still pursue the i30n or is it a no-brainer and the stinger gt every day of the week and he says yes i am aware of the vast cost difference of both cars and this is where the shortlist gets a bit kooky, frankly, because they're such different animals, right? And in a sense, if i30N is the perfect fit for you, then Stinger is not, and vice versa. Forget about the $24,000 difference in driveway price, okay? The Stinger GT is a kind of long, heavy tourer, okay? And the i30N is a car that loves to be thrown around aggressively, you know? That's its purpose. So I guess if I had to drive, you know, 400 kilometres, A to B or something, or a couple of hundred k's, if there were any freeway uh, stretches in that or good back roads that I could just enjoy driving, I think it'd be a far more relaxed experience in the Stinger, Okay, and there's no shortage of performance potential in the Stinger either, in a straight line. In fact, when you look at it, you know, the 
The Stinger makes 272 kilowatts at 6,000 RPM, okay, and the i30N makes 202 at 6,000. So that's a substantial difference, but it is offset to some degree by the difference in their mass, right? So the Stinger is 20% heavier, which is roughly 300 kilograms. So this sort of narrows the gap in performance potential, but when you look at the power to weight ratio, it's 153 kilowatts per tonne for the Stinger versus 137 for the i30N, and that makes the i30N roughly 12% slower in a straight line. But off the mark, the Stinger is probably going to be a little bit better because Although the i30N has launch mode and all of that stuff, you get intrinsic benefits to rear wheel drive when you're launching on a green light, right? Because the rear wheels are doing the driving and that's where the weight's going when you launch, right? Whereas with the front drive, you're always lifting off, off the front end when you take off. So they're sort of inherently compromised and they need to have strategies in place like traction control and the e-diff and all of that stuff to make them hook up and really go. So in a straight line, sting it every time overtaking stinger every time driving long distances stinger every time having fun in a bend i30n every frigging time like just every time okay um six-speed manual at the moment obviously for uh, for i30n but the dct to come the thing about dcts to date has been that they've been fairly unrefined at slow speed and I believe that the uh, DCT coming into the i30N is going to be the same as the DCT coming in the Santa Fe and currently in the Sorento. And one of the big tricks that DCT has, right, frankly, is off the mark, like just idling off the mark or reversing up a ramp or something of that nature, low speed maneuvering against gravity, in other words, or some inertial load. It's as smooth as silk. It feels almost as good as an epicyclic auto with a torque converter. So if they can retune the shifting strategy, which I assume is pretty much a no-brainer, and also retain that low-speed civility in the i30N, then that's going to be a real plus for that vehicle. So the other thing to consider is about the dynamics of cornering, okay? And you can tell a lot from the specs if you know what to look for. The Stinger is 4.83 metres long and the i30N is 4.33, okay? So that's an 11% difference in length. And the wheelbase on the Stinger is about 2.9 versus about 2.65 for the i30N. So that's 10%. So what we're talking about here is a car in the Stinger that is 20% heavier sort of thing and 10%-ish longer and there's this thing called a moment of inertia okay and at the risk of pointing with a friggin spanner which i know some people don't appreciate if this is your stinger actually let's use it like that as a stinger with a big heavy mass at the front if that's your stinger then it's going to have a resistance to moving in the plane of yaw like this right which it has to do when you get around a corner because to go around a corner cars do two things right they move they translate around the corner but they also rotate in yaw so i'll do that so you can see it now <laughs> They move, right, like this, and they translate around the corner, but they also rotate, and they do both things together. So the, the challenge with a big, heavy car with a lot of mass and a lot of length in the wheelbase is it makes it much harder to rotate. You have to try harder. The steering has to try harder. It's just not receptive to moving like this in the way that a lighter, shorter vehicle is. And intrinsically, that what, that's what makes the Stinger a better cruiser, and it's what makes the i30 a better cornering machine, right? And the rest of it's just tuning finesse and hardware, okay? So that's what the philosophical differences between these cars are all about. So let's get to the end of these questions from Stumpy here, which is uh, kind of long, but I think, you know, if you're going through that process and you've got two very different cars, you've really got to think about it hard. Like what's one good at and what the, what is the other one bad at? And what's the overlap? What are they both good at? Well, they're both pretty satisfying to drive. And I like them both, and I'd probably love to drive an i30N around a twisty road and then transition into stinger mode for the trip back on the freeway or something like that. But if I was just loping along in the country, the stinger, 
right? Or driving to work in traffic, the stinger. The other thing about the wheelbase, of course, is you get more cabin space. So you've got to put other people in the car. That means more leg room for them. So there's these kinds of considerations as well, which are not exactly red-blooded performance-enjoying considerations, but they also matter if you're putting somebody else in that vehicle and inflicting your driving on them, right? So... Ben says, assuming parameters that can be controlled are similar, which car between the two do you feel would be easier to find a buyer for when it comes to parting with it? Look, in the used market, there's always going to be a market for credible performance cars. And you'll just get a different kind of buyer who wants the Stinger and a different kind of buyer who wants the i30N. And they're both niche vehicles, right? So not everyone is going to be happy with it, but you'll find someone who is, you know. Ben says, I found the auto in the Stinger GT to be very responsive. It is. It's that eight-speed auto that is also in the current model Santa Fe and the previous generation Sorento, I think. Anyway. He says, however, I'm a big fan of the responsiveness of a DCT. Me too. The shift quality, fantastic. And if you do go for the DCT, I think you'll be impressed with the refinement at low speeds, which has previously not been much of a thing with DCTs, frankly. So I think we've covered off the transmissions and uh, Ben goes on and says, I apologize in advance if this is still too challenging to provide reasonable answers to, i.e. if trying to compare these two different vehicles is an unreasonable request. Stumps. No, that's not unreasonable at all, Stumps. And, you know, it's not exactly I can't decide between a Yaris and a Land Cruiser. They're both performance cars. They both feel good to drive. If you're a driving enthusiast, you could love them each, but for different reasons, right? And I think you've just got to go down both of those bridges and imagine what life is going to be like in each one and which version of that life ultimately is better. I mean, that's how I'd do it anyway. So, with that in mind, let's go over to you for a little while now and answer some questions that have been coming through in the chat from you. So CV says, my local Holden dealer's signs have just come down and new Hyundai signs put up, sign of the times. Yeah, that happens a lot. That's, that's happening a great deal now. See, one of the hard things about being a car dealer, and hey, I'm no apologist for dealers, they're ambush predators i often say and they are but you know they got a huge investment in ci right corporate identity so they've got to do all of this branding and fit out of their premises which is just horrendously expensive and let's not forget the real estate itself generally is a huge investment so it's got me stuffed why there's not a, a much better online procurement service than going to a frigging car dealership. And the reason is, of course, that they want you there so that they can get you face-to-face and sign you up and use every coercive tactic. And let's face it, with an ambush predator, the key thing is for you to stand on the X. And it's a lot easier to paint the X on a physical piece of real estate, no matter how expensive it is to set up. So in the online shopping domain, right, you've got... This terrible problem, terrible problem for online sellers that they call cart abandonment, right? So somebody goes shopping online and they fill up their shopping cart with this and that. They have a fantasy shop and then they just drop it and leave it behind. So there's all these shopping carts full of stuff that represents a profit to whatever business and it's just never capitalized on, right? So there's that. And I I guess that's why it makes sense for a car dealer to spend so much money on the real estate. But hey, it's not a cheap experiment at all for them to change a Holden site to a Hyundai site or a Mitsubishi site, whatever. It's hugely expensive and then they've got to make it pay. And right now, of course, the market is saturated with supply limitation. So It's great to have somebody come in and say, yeah, I'll take one, I'll take that. If the dealer is saying, we can't supply it until February, they can stitch you up, they can sign a contract with you and you can be locked in, but nobody gets paid until you sit behind the wheel of that car and just, you know, drive off into the sunset. So this is part of the the underlying uh, commercial reality. You know, you see those signs changing, that costs heaps. Uh, Travis Hastings says, unless, oh no, that's not really one that we want to read. That's just a bit of a comment between punter v punter there. Uh, Dean Cass says, your thoughts on Boris Johnson's announcement yesterday saying that all petrol, diesel and hybrid cars will be banned in the UK from 2030. Okay. 
I have been getting a lot of questions of that nature. And the bottom line there is exactly how are they going to make that happen, right? Because currently there's not the supply chain to service a market like the UK with exclusively alternative fueled vehicles, okay? So there's that. And the other thing is promises that exceed the electoral term. They're pretty easy to sort of write out, aren't they? They're pretty easy to edit down the track when it becomes obvious that the next government or the next three governments' time, whatever, they can't honour that promise. Maybe they've changed sides as well, you know. They might have had half time and had to switch sides and instead of the Tories it can be whatever, you know. And the next government could be philosophically opposed to that. So what I'd suggest is it's really easy to make promises of this nature and then for them to be trivialised and written away. I remember uh, famously the minister at the time, Paul Fletcher it was, made an announcement. He stood in front of the Australian public and said, by whatever date, which is long past, it will be possible for Australian car buyers to buy new vehicles independently from overseas. And of course, this gave the Federal Chamber of Automotive Industry multiple heart attacks, okay? They were rushed to the nearest emergency department and unfortunately their life was saved and they went on to lobby the government very convincingly indeed, which is what their job is. They're the grubbiest anti-consumer lobby group I can think of in the automotive domain. And Essentially, they got the minister to reverse his position on that. And then the narrative was that, oh, well, after due consideration, that he couldn't really do that. And it all just sunk to the bottom of the Marianas frigging trench. And it wasn't a speculation from the minister. It wasn't like, we'll look into this and my objective is to allow this to happen, right? It wasn't that at all. It was, I promise that we will do this by then. It was a concrete promise in the time domain, a commitment to a particular course of action, and the rug just went like this, and the idea was banished. It was retroactively deleted from the record. The, the minister would never engage you in conversation about it now, right? So I'd suggest this kind of thing could happen easily to this ban. It's, it's like really easy for Volvo to say, we will banish road death in our vehicles by this date, right? It's easy to say that. It was easy for Volkswagen to say, we will be the world's number one car manufacturer by 2018. But, you know, it's it's easy to make the promises. It's really hard to come good with them. And I don't see, I really don't see it happening because alternative fuel vehicles are so expensive now, right? And there's not the supply volume. And nine years is not that long. I mean, look at what's happened with hybrids. 25 years worth of hybrids, uh, hybrids and hybrids on Shitsville roads, okay? And one in 35 vehicles sold today is a hybrid, okay? That's without any government incentivization. And, you know, electric vehicles, 25 years' time, might be one in 35, might be one in 20 if we're lucky. But I don't see a future being more electrified than that unless something radical and unforeseen happens, which could always be the case but you know call me a pragmatist i'm not seeing it and i'm seeing some sort of immense backpedaling from the uk in about 2028 or 2029 keith says i went car hunting over the la over the last two day can't find one dealers all suffer from split personality uh great when you go in but when you won't give in 2k deposit on a car that doesn't exist they get all an ease I don't know what a knees is, but I can infer what that means. Yeah, they do. Look, the thing about car dealers is if they can't supply the car, don't commit to buying it. My default advice is don't commit because supply will ease up in quarter one or quarter two of next year and something better might come along. You know, or there might be some massive price reduction or, or whatever. But if you've signed a contract now and you are locked in to the state of play now, then it's bad for you in two or three months time. If the situation changes dramatically, there's more competition, there's more discounting, you could have got a better price, there's a better competitor has been launched over the past two months or something. I don't see the advantage to you in locking yourself in now. What I see the advantage is, is to the dealer in being able to budget 
this much income on that date and not have to worry about that. I don't see it helping you. So I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't lock myself in in that manner if I were you. Uh, James Barry says, what's your thoughts on Nadal Stello's reviews on Cars Guide? Bit sick of all their videos and presenters find, have to watch them to see what car actually looks like without dealing with the vultures. Well, my take, I, I haven't really looked at Nadal's uh, videos, frankly, but... My take on all car reviews in Australia is that they're bad, okay? Like, they're bad because, and I don't blame the presenters so much, okay? I really don't because what publishers have done is they've invested in uh, a budget for video production, but they haven't trained their presenters. They haven't given them broadcast experience on TV or radio, right? And if you're lucky enough to have uh, done a lot of that, as I have, then you get that experience at the coalface, right? But... The other thing about the reviews is, like, I see all these all these fundamental mistakes. Like, someone will walk in and go, I'm John Smith from Cars Guide, and this is the new BMW M3. And I just go, <laughs> shoot me. Because there's a super comes up on the screen, and the dude's name is there, and you know what the car is because you freaking clicked on it. You want to see that review. And... There's this golden rule in video production, broadcast, whatever, is to move the story forward. Like reach out through the glass teat, grab your reader by the lapels, your viewer, whatever, and pull them in like this and don't allow them to break your grasp on them by moving the story forward, right? And I don't see that happening. I just see a lot of people trying to do top gear badly and it's bad because they don't have the budget they haven't got a second unit shooting a million cutaways and they don't have a helicopter up in the sky with a fleur you know for every frigging or they don't even have a dji inspire one right they they don't do that stuff they haven't got the hollywood rig with the the gimbal on the back of the black porsche KN shooting really cool tracking shots in a closed circuit they're just shooting stuff like news and current affairs but they're pretending it's top gear and it's bad too because most of the journalists journalists who review cars in australia at least in my view have as their primary objective the appeasement of the car maker which lent them the car and that's so terrible it's like oh, induce vomiting now because it's the review is not really for the car maker is it it's for you i'd suggest that review exists for you to click on and watch and unless its construction is absolutely from the ground up oriented to you out there in the audience that review is a nauseating fail and this is one of the reasons, frankly, why the car industry can't stand me. It's because I talk to you and I tell you exactly what I think. And I'm not suggesting that I'm just some voice in the wilderness doing that. There are probably other people doing that as well. Scotty Kilmer does a pretty good job of that in the United States. He's moved to Tennessee now, many of you have told me. But I like, kind of like Scotty's attitude. He's not afraid to call Mercedes-Benz the endless money pit that it is. And Jason Fenske does a pretty good job as well in Engineering Explained, for example. The, the dudes at the fast lane, TFL, right? They bought the cheapest Land Rover Defender and then they drove it like 167 miles and it shat itself and and there's this litany of it shitting itself right and they're unafraid to detail that in a responsible way and I kind of dig that you know because these dudes are putting you first they're authentically relating actual experiences to you and they don't give a shit what the car maker thinks of what they say and frankly for the information ecosystem to be healthier what we need to do is we need to have more reviews like that, more people telling you what they actually think and preferably people with vast industry experience and some, some kind of qualifications so that they can appreciate the nuances of the, of the machine, right? And that's sadly lacking in a lot of motoring journalists as well. They just like driving new cars every week, but they don't know very much about the industry and they don't know very much about the machine itself, except how it drives around corners. And frankly, that's not enough. So do you get the feeling like this might be a soapbox <laughs> topic for me? I think it probably is. We should move on now. Um, 
Brogues 01. Oh, no, that looks like just a piece of conversation. Tone now. I haven't heard from Tone for a while or I haven't seen him randomly pop up in the chat. He says, channels dealing with older cars tend to have way better production values uh, than many new car review channels. Mighty Car Mods and Motoring Box springs to mi- spring to mind. Yeah, that's absolutely true as well. Marty and Moog do a fantastic job on Mighty Car Mods in particular, and they both have a background, as I understand it, in TV production. Like, like according to Moog, I, I've spoken to Moog twice. I interviewed him once on Radio 2 UE, and uh, I met him once at a YouTube function, and uh, and Marty, and really nice guys, and he did mention to me that they had a background in TV production. And the other thing is they've turned what is what used to be at least in australia a, a staple which would be dudes and their mates just mucking around with cars in the driveway at home in the shed sort of thing they've turned that into an art form and it's a really good formula because we can all relate to that maybe it's not cars maybe it's construction in the shed or maybe it's something that you do maybe it's welding or turning or milling or whatever it is but there's always been dudes getting together at the weekend mucking around with stuff okay And the stuff just happens to be cars in the case of Mighty Car Mods. And there's this voracious appetite for people to put bigger turbos on WRXs and slam a Forester and improve its handling and do all of that stuff. And Marty and Moog have just tapped into that in the way that Street Machine probably should have done uh, 10 or 15 years earlier if they'd wanted to maintain their um, uh, position of marketplace domination. I mean, Marty and Moog are so frigging popular, frankly, that they don't need to go on TV or they don't need to do anything else like that. They haven't got to publish any uh, printed pro- uh, property. They're just, they're, they've just got an epic audience that a TV would envy. You know, it's kind of, they're kind of like the Joe Rogan experience of Australian automotive YouTubers, right? If you haven't seen Mighty Car Mods, check it out because it is really good. And one of the things about it being really good is that Marty and Moog, the Marty and Moog that you see on screen are actually the Marty and Moog that you meet when you meet them in person, which is totally unlike meeting some news and current affairs, I hesitate to call them celebrities, but, you know, it's totally unlike meeting someone who's actually got a bit of a platform on TV. So there's that. Peter Ossie now says, Hi, John, you mentioned electric cars and kits. Scotty mentioned a Chinese electric car for just $7,000 US dollars. Have you seen an electric car as cheap as this after taxes and charges would be about 60,000 bucks Australian? Yeah, look, I think there is some exciting sort of cheap electric car developments to come out of China. They appear to be working on that. I I did a report a couple of weeks ago about uh, designing the perfect EV. I called it the Chitois just because it was, uh, you know, a pretty nasty car that just takes you a short distance for the domestic running around right you could charge it fast you could leave it outside birds could crap on it you wouldn't care okay and hey many of you have let me know that the Chinese are already doing that so that could be quite interesting and that could be a way to get a proliferation of EVs if they were economically rational as a second car maybe four or five thousand dollars more than a comparable brand new internal combustion car I could see people justifying that level of economic irrationality Okay, but this current Gulf, which is about twenty five thousand bucks or more internal combustion versus EV equivalent, that's very hard to swallow, impossible to swallow if you are not a full on EV zealot. I think, you know, and and it's um, and this is absolutely the differential diagnosis. The confirmation of that is when you look at the sales figures, the sales figures of EVs are low everywhere where there is not massive government support. And it's because the price premium is economically irrational, but they are good to drive. No doubt about that. They're good for pollution in our cities. And let's not forget air pollution kills two and a half times more people than car crashes. It's a serious problem. And also they're good for energy security in our nation, which is also a serious threat to our national security, much more of a serious threat, I think, than things like terrorism, which does seem to receive uh, above, well above its weight in terms of support and exposure. So there's that. 
Uh, Michael Anthony now says, Hi, John, I've been looking at a Volkswagen Golf R 7.5. At one point, the prices were in the high $50,000 mark. Now they're as high as nearly seventy grand. Why is this? The price of used cars has spiked, particularly late model used cars, and it's a consequence of the market, okay? When people cannot buy the new car that they want for the next three months because of the supply limitations that I talked about earlier, what do they do, right? They turn to late model used cars. So this supply constraint in the new car domain has had a knock-on effect into the late model used car market and it's pumped up the price. And what you're seeing there, I'd suggest, is mainly a consequence of that. So normal programming will probably resume there, like the price of used cars will fall in maybe the second or third quarter of next year. So spray liberally with 2020 FO and... We might not even need that in six weeks' time, which would be lovely. I think might have to upgrade to 2121 FO because the first half could be almost but not quite as much fun as all of this year has been, but I certainly hope not. So there's that. Uh, Crisco Wally says, Hi, John. What extra accessory is good to have, i.e. Windows Weather Shield? I find handy floor mats and seat covers. Okay, so the accessories that you want to include in a car are the ones that are going to absolutely benefit you and not just the ones you think are a good idea because the Ming Mole has taken the zipper down to about here to convince you to buy that saxophone holder that you've always wanted for the roof rack system, right? So if you like the weather shields on the windows, then hey, get them. And maybe it's a good idea to get headlight protectors if you've got those expensive LED headlights, because if a rock hits them, you're probably going to be up for 1500 bucks or something to replace them, or $9,000 in an Audi S8. Okay, so there's things of that nature. Mats are a good idea. You know, I'm not a big fan of the tinting at dealerships because you can get exactly the same tinting from exactly the same dude with plumber's crack in exactly the same van for about half the price if you just engage him independently. If you're going to get tinting, just get a good film with 100% UV, uh, you know, uh, amelioration, you know, attenuation is a better word than that. Blocking 100% of the UV and seat covers. Okay, so... If your car has airbags in the seat back, right, so those thorax protecting airbags that pop out at a billion miles an hour to stop you getting a lacerated liver when you get T-boned because your ribs are unbroken, then be very careful about the seat covers because you don't want to spoil the deployment. You don't want to spoil the life-saving protection just because you think it's a good idea to have seat covers. Okay, so generally, unless you can look at the something in the seat cover whatever documentation that specifies it is 100% compatible with the airbag in the seat, run away, do not walk. Okay, so things of that nature. But generally other accessories, I would get a tow bar fitted if you want to do any towing. I'd get the dealer to do that because generally plugging, uh, when you you fit a tow bar now, you also have to have a, a little ECU electronic control unit that plugs in, right, to the CAN bus so that When you plug in a trailer, the computer in the car goes, ah, trailer plugged in. I'll disable the parking sensors and it might also enable other kind of camera modes depending on the sophistication of the car. In this case, okay, the genuine article is probably going to be better than anything aftermarket. But really, the limitation on accessories is just don't go nuts because it's easy to go, yeah, 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 because the blouse is going, it's it's heading to the bottom of the Marianas Trench and with it, your self-restraint. I'll tick that box. I'll tick that box. I'll tick that box. I'll tick that box, right? And before you know it, you've got the pimp's Cadillac of awful accessories. And 10 minutes after zipper goes back up, you think, what was I thinking? So don't let this happen to you, okay? Is I guess what I'm saying there. Tony S says... Although still expensive, a plug-in hybrid has to be worth looking at as you can run full electric around town and petrol on a trip away, one car could do it all. That's not strictly speaking true, Tony, because the battery capacity in a plug-in hybrid is very low, okay, and these ranges that they say up to 35 k's or something, there's a further caveat on that, right, because 
a smaller battery can't supply a great deal of energy quickly. In other words, it can't supply a great deal of power on discharge. And the electric motor on the plug-in hybrid is therefore smaller than the electric motor in a conventional EV. So what you find in practice is that plug-in hybrids operate in EV mode only in states of driving around town where there is very low load, like very low demand from the driver, very slight pressure on the accelerator, in other words. So battling against low inertial, inertial loads and low inclines and just sort of cruising along gently on the flat. As soon as you've got to do anything severe, you need more power than the battery can supply and more power than the engine can deliver. And therefore, the internal combustion engine kicks in. So a lot of people have alleged this to me about plug-in hybrids or one size fits all and the internal combustion engine is not needed because this car can run 35 k's on electric power what you don't see in the fine print is that yeah it can do that but only when the load is particularly low i drove a a plug-in hybrid outlander a few weeks ago and tested that hypothesis actually and you can drive if you're very careful you can drive exclusively in uh, ev mode if you like but as soon as you get to a steep hill and you want to keep going at like 50 k's an hour around the burbs or something the internal combustion engine uh, kicks in and if you want to get off in a sprightly fashion at the lights internal combustion engine so it's not exactly the same thing mate mario espinoza says hi john just uh, bought my first dual cab ute the she max also called the BT50 in the olden days, but I like Shemax better. Hashtag, tone, respect. Um, I'm hearing a lot of talk re-secondary fuel filters and oil catch cans as must-dos. Any thoughts would be appreciated. Well, Mario, I don't think there's been enough time for that engine. It's it's like an evolution of that, whatever they call it, 4JJ whatever, uh, Isuzu engine, that three-litre uh, four-cylinder engine. I don't think it's been running around long enough yet for us to know whether that's a good idea or not. But, you know, you can't really hurt a car by putting in another fuel filter as long as the fuel filter doesn't fail catastrophically and flow downstream and clog up the fuel pump and the injectors. There's that. And a catch can is unlikely to damage the engine either – Although you'd have to be uh, careful about the implementation of that so that there wasn't a really negative feedback effect from that also. So if they're professional products with uh, th- that are made to a suitably high quality and standard that suit the vehicle and they're professionally installed, I don't see it hurting, but it may not be necessary. And the current iteration of that Isuzu engine, we don't have enough in-service information about it to know whether it's required or not, mate. Now, uh, Bolts, Bolts, Bolts says, G'day, John. What's your opinion on the BMW mini dual clutch transmission setup? I'm aware it's a dry clutch system, but wondering if you've come across any issues or premature failures. You know, it's been forever since I've driven a Mini. I haven't driven a Mini for years, for donkey's years now. Anyway, um, Mini's kind of a really small player, but I tell you what, I don't get complaints about dual clutch setups that are not Fords or Volkswagens. Get plenty of complaints about them, but I don't get complaints about the Hyundai Kia DCT, and I don't get complaints about the Mini DCT ever. So that's got to tell you something. So uh, I, I wish I had more uh, concrete sort of feedback for you there, first-hand driving experience, but I tend to concentrate on mainstream brands, which, frankly, Mini is not. Now, where are we in the time domain? It's just about 20 minutes after 1. It's 1.18.07, plus about a 20-second delay if you're watching live. So we'll take another few of these questions. Don't forget, I will be back at 8.30 p.m., the regular Thursday slot, which is like seven hours from now if your question doesn't get a run today uh in this session get back to me this evening and i'll try and get through as many of your questions as i can then kind of like the live thing it's almost like being back on radio but without the rules and no producer and no content director storming down the corridor in the ad break going don't you ever say that again you bastard like that so It's kind of uplifting being here doing this. James Barry now says, any risk in buying a new car in 2020 and losing any resale opportunity with more electric and self-driving cars on the way? 
what more self-driving cars, James? There, There is not one self-driving car currently available in Australia. It's kind of illegal too, as far as I know. And most of the self-driving technology is, let's be kind, imperfect. I mean, Electric Jesus is famous for rolling out almost ready, like beta testing self-driving technology on the public. And it routinely fails and kills people. Okay, just look at Tesla autopilot death in go- under Google. Do a Google search and be entertained. It's human stupidity plus the promise of technology that can't deliver. I mean, you call something autopilot, people are going to think that it's an autopilot, right? As in a system that you can go to sleep behind the wheel when it is engaged. Okay, it doesn't work, and there are no other cars that I know of, and. Electric car sales are so low currently that they will have no conceivable effect on the resale value of any Australian vehicle for at least a decade, okay? And those knobs in South Australia have just decided to impose a user tax on EVs, which will further suppress the sale of EVs in that state because it's going to make owning one even less attractive. So well done there, South Australian governmental dicks. You know, if we want EVs, if we have a rational conversation in society and our elected representatives faithfully represent that desire of the electorate, and let's face it, we're pretty much in fantasy land territory when... (laughs) when we suppose that that might happen, because they have to appease the coal industry, etc., then if we have that conversation and we decide that EVs are a good idea which must be embraced, then, yeah, we might get a few more EVs getting sold. But it's going to be a long time before Australia is Norway in the context of EV sales and government incentives. Like, it's not going to happen. You know, it's not going to foreseeably occur. So there's that. Now, uh, Ilka Tube says, what do you think of the Mark I and its sticker price? The Mark I Mustang is kind of okay i forget exactly what the sticker price is i could look at that but i I did a report on that a few weeks ago the main thing is um i'll I'll have a look at the price now if you like just bear with me men can't talk and type at the same time of course because you know multitasking is so difficult but if if we just shelve the issue of the sticker price momentarily and we just think about what do I think of it? I think it's a sideshow because they're not going to sell that many. It is quite expensive. It's 90 grand or something, if memory serves. And the other problem with the Mustang is, of course, its safety and its falling popularity because, you know, Mustang's had its sales heyday. It really does. It really has had its sales heyday. And uh, I don't see the Mark One resurrecting that. But um, I'll just have a little look if they've got the... No, they haven't got it listed here. I'd have to go to news press and that'll take forever. Look, let's just say it's going to be about 90 grand. Please correct me in the chat if I'm wrong. I'm doing that from memory. But the problem with Mustang is that these halo cars, they they seem awesome in the moment and I'm sure they're great to drive, but they're quite unsafe. I wouldn't be putting any children in the back ever. So if you're that divorced dad and you've made uh, reasonable money and you buy your Mark One. Don't put the kids in the back when you've got them for the weekend because it's really unsafe back there. And, you know, I'm not so sure it'll be worth very much at resale time because Mustang popularity went like this and now it's going like that, okay? And that's just an unfortunate commercial reality that that, that there's no getting away from. Now, Best Family Cars, who I know reasonably well, says... Master 6 attends a wagon, Subaru Lavorg, Hyundai i40 wagon, don't get the ZB Commodore or Mondeo, both defunct. Yeah, agreed with all of that. That's probably a bit of advice about which wagons make sense, which he would know about, that young chap. So there's that. Um, Dan Wallace now. And bestfamilycars.com.au, he's trying to get that off the ground at the moment, so you could show him some love this afternoon while you're allegedly working from home bestfamilycars.com.au scott's a good guy 
Uh, we have, uh, this is Dan Wallace now, says, we have fully autonomous trucks at work. They're on a mine site and effectively closed loop system. They're pretty reliable, but they do have their downfalls. Don't think it will be on sale soon. No, look, in industry, it's really easy, uh, technically, no, not really easy, but compared with <laughs> real world on-road deployment, it's easy to have autonomous forklifts and autonomous trucks in an environment that you can control, right? Because if you can lay down the logic, then it's really simple, you know? The cars can all talk to each other, the trucks can all talk to each other, the roads are fully defined and they know where they are. And it's easy to identify the potential conflicts and work around them, okay? That's not a huge technical challenge. What's a huge technical challenge is to put an autonomous car on an imperfect road system that's not particularly well defined from a data point of view and then mix it up with a whole bunch of cars that are being operated by completely unpredictable humans, right? That's an epic challenge and it has not yet been solved. And excuse me, and to my knowledge, knowledge it won't be solved anytime soon. So there's kind of that to consider. That's there are definite places for autonomy. And that the perfect example of autonomy is to go to a car factory like that dirty big fuck off car factory in Ulsan where they make all their Hyundais, right? And it's just epic. It's like industry on an epic scale, right? I forget, we did a doco on that joint and it's like they make a car every five seconds or something, 24-7. <laughs> and they and the materials come in at one end, right? And every five or six seconds, a car pops out at the other end, which is a shipyard. So the end of the factory is the ship, right? And there's these teams of dudes and all they do is they, sit, they, they get in a minibus on the ship and they come out and 15 of them get in cars. And they drive them up onto the ship and get back in the minibus. And they do that all day long for like eight hours. But the perfect example of autonomy is to watch many of the steps in the car production process. And the only thing you find is that in the autonomous sections of the production line, people don't go there, right? The robots know exactly where everything is and bits move and all this shit happens and it's quite complex and it's oddly macabre to watch too. It's like it, it, it's like a deleted sort of scene from Terminator whatever, you know? It's, it's pretty cool to watch and autonomy is easy in that environment because it's so well defined and I've spent cumulatively hours looking at cars being produced in places like that and I've never seen a single hiccup although I'm sure they do have them so the more tightly defined you can uh, make a process and the the geography in which that process occurs the easier it is to automate right and the problem with taking automation out onto the road is that it's so hard to define all of the bits. Like it's impossible. We don't have computers that smart. We don't have programmers that smart. You know, the first time a ro can you imagine the first time a robot car actually kills an innocent person, right? Well, how do you define the logic of who's going to die when there's an alternative? How do you do that? I don't know. What's the morality of death when it can be defined by programming? I really don't know the answers to those things, but the first time we have a truly innocent person die from a failure of a robot car, like it just goes burko and drives through a cafe instead of down the road then it's going to be bridget driscoll all over again okay you'll have to look up bridget driscoll pretty interesting i suggest you do that i think there's a pretty good wikipedia ent entry on bridget driscoll check her out and then get back to me and see what the response might be like if the same kind of thing happens with a robot car. But it has to be robot car goes completely burko, right? Drives to a shop instead of the road kind of thing. Now, let's move on. Chris Yem says, what's blue, black and white? And when it falls out of a tree, it will hurt you. Jesus Christ. Dad joke from hell. A fridge wearing denim jacket and sunglasses. Straya! I have to say, Chris, that is just... Thank you so much for your contribution to the show. Chris Yam, ladies and gentlemen, well done. Now, David Jenkins. Gee, 
If a modern Mustang is dangerous for the passengers, then a restored Yank tank would be worse. Yes, it would. Now, uh, he goes on and says, Bummer, the missus can't come for a drive anymore in the 65 Galaxy 500 convertible. So sad. Brackets, not. Yeah, I get the point you're trying to make here, but I guess a broader point I'd make about all these classic old cars is that they're shit boxes. Okay? I'm going to say that again, so there's no equivocation. They're shit boxes. Beautiful shit boxes. Shit boxes that you might lust after. But trust me on this, the best thing you can do with cars of that nature is put them, get them restored to concourse condition and put them in a glass box and don't drive them. Because when you drive them, you see how good modern cars are by virtue of how shit the old ones were, right? I remember... Once we did this test with uh, Motor Magazine, Hero 6's kind of test, and we used the um, supercharged Falcon, uh, uh, sorry, the turbocharged 4-litre 6-cylinder Falcon, and then there was an R32 Skyline and an E38 Charger from the 70s, right? And an E38 Charger was a properly quick thing, which was victorious at Bathurst, if memory serves, and it was also, it remained properly quick in the context of many subsequent years, right? So the bottom line there is that on that test, this was a punter's car, right? So he had lovingly restored this E38 Charger, and I hate driving the punter's car, right? Because what if you bend it? What if something happens, you know? I don't know. A wombat runs out and you collect it and you upend the car. You know, you just impregnate the everything forward, everything rearwards from the radiator with wombat, right? I hate driving the punter's car. Anyway, and he was so keen to get me to drive it. John, 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 drive it, drive it, drive it like this. And I got in it finally and drove it around Mount Macedon in uh, Victoria and it was awful. You know, the wheel was about this big, seemingly, and it was offset one, I can't remember what way, and the pedals were offset in relation to the seat as well. So you're kind of holding the wheel here and putting your feet over here on the pedals and at the same time as sitting in the seat here. And the seat belt was up like this and no adjustment, obviously, and no inertia reel, obviously. You know, so it was grotting you and the seat bounced out of phase with the suspension and four bends into it, the brakes are burning right? Because everything was shit about old cars, except how they look and how you feel about them. They're beautiful, don't get me wrong, and I totally respect and admire the hard work and literally blood, sweat and tears that goes into, you know, operating, uh, doing any of the restoration of old cars, right? I get that. I'm just saying that the driving is emphatically crap. That's just kind of how it is. Now, Given that it's just gone one thirty, and I'm going to be back here again in seven-ish hours' time, I'd like to thank you absolutely sincerely for joining me on the live stream, and I'll end it there. Don't forget to hook up with me again tonight at 8.30, and I'll answer your questions exclusively live then. Thank you very much for taking this lunchtime to engage with me on today's live stream.